Good evening and welcome once again to Channel 514 and SPK Plus, where we are, as usual, continuing our series Exploring Ancient Literature. Now, at this point in our series, we are exploring early Greek literature, and the earliest big thing in ancient Greek literature is Homer, of course. So, here we are discussing Homer's Odyssey. Now, in our previous video, I described and discussed the Odyssey very generally, without giving any synopsis of any part of the text, of the plot of the text itself. So, I discussed what it is, what it's about, who are some of the characters, what are some of the major themes and preoccupations in our story. But now we'll get right into the story itself. And I'll mention one more thing before doing that. And that is that the Homeric epics begin a tradition in Western literature in which the story begins in the middle, so some kind of situation has been going on for some time, and where we pick up the thread of the story, things have already been going on for some time, and so we are, so to speak, in the middle. Now, there's a phrase for this in Latin, and it's in, well, it goes like this, in medias res, so we are beginning in the middle. And that is the case with the Odyssey. So part of the reason why I mention this, other than the fact that it is an important principle in general, in and of itself, is that there is plenty of background material to take into consideration as we read through the text and as we think about what's going on in the plot of our story. So, just a moment. So we need to, I have to manage this uh, train of thought of mine anyway, but where we are in our story, as I said, is in the middle, and there's all kinds of background that is, not surprisingly, back there in the background. And our poet, Homer, will sometimes refer to things that his audience would have known, because they would have been part of the traditional lore of heroic mythology, but which are unknown to us, or little known to us. So, when he suddenly takes, uh, when he suddenly interrupts the flow of his narrative and describes something that happened in the past, in a time which his narrative itself does not describe, then we may wonder if there's some missing epic or something like that that we're missing or was that in the prequel, so to speak, or is that going to be explained later on in greater detail, or is he perhaps going to come out with a prequel later on, like filmmakers sometimes do in modern times? But, of course, the ancients would not have needed any such thing, because all of this traditional material would have been somewhat familiar to them, and so they're not patronizing the poet so much for the story that he's going to tell them as for how he tells it. So that is something to keep in mind. So when we get to a part where there's some background material that isn't already obvious or isn't already well established from some previous passage in the Odyssey or the Iliad for that matter, then I'll take 
a few moments, or I'll describe it as quickly and cursorily as I can, so as to make that clear, but for our purposes there won't be really all that much need to bother with that sort of thing, but here and there I think it, it will be worthwhile to to bother with it. But anyway, let's not temporize or stall for time here and let's get right into the Odyssey. Now, I'll show you a map because I said in the last video that different Greek islands vie with one another for the honor of being Homer's Ithaca, and there's a particular island known as Ithaca or Ithaki today, which has all but won this honor for itself. And whether or not that is Homer's Ithaca, I of course cannot tell you. So failing that, I will show you on a map where, according to the most generally accepted theory, Homer's Ithaca is. So anyway, here is a map at the beginning of our text, and of course we're using Robert Fagel's translation from Penguin Classics. This is the deluxe edition. I just have this one from this edition, but there is a popular boxed edition of it with the Iliad and the Odyssey in two volumes, and a nice little box, you know, but, and I should say, as I did when we discussed the Iliad, that I'm not using Fagel's translation for any particular reason other than that I have it ready to hand. Now, I do have another one ready to hand, that of Robert Fitzgerald, which is somewhat older. Fitzgerald, I believe, made his translation somewhere around the middle of the 20th century. But, and of course he has an Iliad and an Aeneid to boot, but we're using this one just because. So if you like another, then that's fine. As far as I'm concerned with this text, they're really all fine. So if you like another one, then be my guest. But here we are with Fagels, and here's his map. And let's see if I can look at this backwards and point to Ithaca. I can. And here it is. It's not very big, as you can see. Am I pointing at the right place? Yeah, I am. Okay. There we are. So the nearest island to it, I guess, would be Same and... Let's see. Well, that's enough of that, anyway. Same is the largest island near to it. I'm not sure what that's called today, if it has a different name or not, because a lot of the Greek islands have different names now than they did in antiquity, for one reason or another, but... Here's Little Ithaca, and in this map, Troy, because of course Odysseus is one of the Greek leaders in the Trojan War, Troy would be around here somewhere, so it's cut off in our map, but of course it's in northwestern Asia Minor, and that puts it on the other side of the Aegean, and so out of the picture here. But, of course there are some nice maps in this volume, so I may as well just show another one. Here is the Aegean Basin all around, and so here's mainland Greece and the Peloponnese, Thrace up here, Asia Minor over here, and Troy in this area right here. So Odysseus, of course, is uh, coming from here, and he wants to get, again, off the map to uh, over here somewhere where Ithaca is. So anyway, let's pick up with book one. And again, we are in medias res, we are beginning in the middle. So here we are in the middle, and what's happening right now? Well, that's what we are about to find out. So, ten minutes into our video, here we are beginning now. And I should mention, as I meant to earlier, that we're going to go through books one through eight. So, however long it takes, that's what I'm going to do in this video, because with a text of this size, you're sort of damned if you do and damned if you don't, so I don't want to make too many videos here about this one text, and neither do I want to 
jam the whole thing or half of the whole thing and later the other half into some very very long videos so I'm gonna do this in three I think one through eight nine through let me do the math 16 and 17 through 24 and there you have it that's what we're going to do now book one Fagels calls it Athena inspires the prince and so just like in the Iliad, we begin with an invocation of the muse. So our poet prays, as part of his poem, he prays to a muse, a goddess who is a patron of his art, and traditionally there are nine muses, and Calliope, like the bird or the butterfly, the Calliope, is the muse of epic poetry. So we can presume that he is praying to her here, but he begins his song in that way, so he says here, in Fagel's translation, Sing to me of the man, Muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course, once he had plundered the hallowed heights of Troy. Many cities of men he saw and learned their minds, many pains he suffered, heartsick on the open sea, fighting to save his life and bring his comrades home. But he could not save them from disaster, hard as he strove. The recklessness of their own ways destroyed them all, the blind fools. They devoured the cattle of the sun, and the sun god wiped from sight the day of their return. Launch out on his story, muse, daughter of Zeus. Start from where you will. Sing for our time, too. So that's the beginning of our invocation to the muse. It goes on a little farther from there, but... Here we are, and we find out that, at this time in our story, all of Odysseus's companions are dead. So, the Trojan War having been won by a stratagem that Odysseus himself had devised, the famous Trojan horse, Odysseus is on his way home, and of course all of the other Greek chieftains are as well, and by now some of them have made it home and are either still living or dead and others well actually at this point he's the only one who's not home yet so they're either dead or they're home and or both they're home and buried or they're home and still alive or whatever but Odysseus is still out there somewhere so and all of his men are dead, so he's alone. And we find that Calypso, the bewitching nymph, the lustrous goddess, held him back deep in her arching caverns, craving him for a husband. So, for some reason, he's marooned on an island with this nymph, Calypso, spelled just like the kind of music. I don't know why that is or what the connection is there. I guess that it's... I don't know, island music or something? I should have looked that up, but... So he's on the island with Calypso, and of course she wants him to stay with her because nymphs and goddesses sometimes fall for human men and gods and satyrs and other supernatural beings in Greek mythology. They sometimes fall for human women, but... Here's Odysseus on the island with Calypso, and she won't let him leave because she wants him to stay with her there, but of course he's pining away for home to continue his journey home and finally reach his little island kingdom of Ithaca once again. So that's where our hero is at the beginning of our story, or in the middle of our story, in Medias Res, and Next, we go to the gods in their, their godly world of Mount Olympus, where they are living their happy, godly life in their fantastic, splendid palaces. And, of course, it says here... Mm, let's see. Every god took pity on Odysseus, that is, all except Poseidon. So part of the reason why Odysseus isn't home yet is that one of the gods, Poseidon, the sea god, is angry with him. And so we'll get to why that is, but anyway, 
and I mentioned it in our last video, but here we are. So we're on Olympus, and Athena is talking to Zeus. Now Athena, of course, gray-eyed Athena, the goddess of wisdom, the patroness of the city of Athens, who has associations with warfare and the defense of the homeland and craftsmanship and all sorts of things. And, of course, she sprung fully formed from the head of Zeus, sprang fully formed from the head of Zeus. And Zeus, of course, the king of the gods, there discussing the situation or the affairs of humankind. And so, meanwhile, of course, I should mention Poseidon is visiting the Ethiopians. So, according to Homer, Poseidon has a special affinity for the Ethiopians. And the Greeks, of course, use the Ethiopians to mean all black African peoples. But here, um, Odysseus and Zeus, or uh, Athena and Zeus, they're talking about how, as Fagels puts it, the way these mortals blame the gods. From us alone, they say, come all their miseries. Yes, from... but they themselves with their own reckless ways, compound their pains beyond their proper share. So they're talking about what has happened and what the Greeks traditionally believed to have happened with the family of the royal family of Mycenae and Agamemnon, the high king, the king of Mycenae and the leader of all the Greeks who went to attack the city of Troy, and how his cousin, Aegisthos, and his wife, Clytemnestra, had murdered him, assassinated him, whatever, on his return from Troy, and so revenge is about to fall upon them, and, if, you know, because uh, according to the story, Agamemnon's son later takes revenge on his mother and uncle for, or his uh, stepfather, if you will, for what they did to his father. So. so look at what these humans are doing, and they're really behaving badly, and when they're having a difficult time, they like to blame the gods, but it's their fault too. So, so say the gods. And Athena calls Zeus's attention to Odysseus's predicament and asks him, Have you no care for him in your lofty heart? Did he never win your favor with sacrifices burned beside the ships on the broad plain of Troy? Why, Zeus, why so dead set against Odysseus? So Zeus then says, Well, I'm not dead set against him. It's my brother, Poseidon, the sea god, and really, we should do something about him. We should do something about this, he says. He says, but come, all of us here, put heads together now, work out his journey home so Odysseus can return. So like I mentioned before, in the Iliad, the gods bedevil the humans <clears throat> really, really badly. But here in the Odyssey, they're going to cut our main character some slack. And so, to do that, they have to set a whole lot of things in motion. So, what Zeus is going to do is... Well, first of all, I should say, he sends Athena down to our human world, down to the little island of Ithaca, where she takes on the guise of a character called Mentes, Lord of the Taphians. So she's disguised as a man who is known on the island of Ithaca and who's respected there. And so she goes and is first noticed by Telemachus, the son of Odysseus. And we find that Telemachus, although he is the rightful successor of his father Odysseus, the king of the island, he is himself 
being tyrannized by the suitors. And as I mentioned before in our last video, the suitors are nobles, young nobles from the mainland and Ithaca itself and probably other islands. And they're there on the island paying court to Odysseus' wife, Penelope. And as we find out, she's been putting them off for years and years, and they're all frustrated with this because Odysseus being presumed dead, they want to take over his kingdom for themselves, or at least someone should be able to do that, and they don't, well, they take umbrage at the fact that they're being put off for so long, and so in the meantime they just live off the island and its wealth and treat it as spoils or as a prey, and so their depredations are causing all kinds of unrest or discontent on the island. So. It's a time of misrule and a time of troubles in Ithaca. But anyway, Athena now appears to Telemachus, and she gets him talking, and gives him the idea, I believe, that, because she appears again later, so I want to make sure, as a different character actually, so I want to make sure I get her two appearances and what she does on these two appearances pretty much right, but anyway, she talks to Telemachus and sort of bothers his conscience and sort of reminds him of the gravity of his situation and encourages him to take a journey in search of news of his father. Now, part of the purpose of that is to get him out from under the suitors, because they are both tyrannizing him and they feel threatened by him also, so possibly at some point they might decide that it would be better to put him to death or somehow make away with him. And so she encourages Telemachus to to do something about all this, but, and, if, and there are different exchanges and conversations with the suitors in this chapter also, so we sort of, in this book, I mean, so in this book, book one, we sort of see what's going on on the island of Ithaca and how bad it is. Now in book two, which Fagels calls Telemachus sets sail, this trip actually materializes Telemachus and some loyal followers go on a voyage in search of news of Odysseus. Now, let's see now. I see. So he recruits some men to go with him on his journey by calling an assembly. And that's something to which I'm hoping to draw attention in one of the future studies in our series of ten studies on sacred scripture and ancient literature, that the suitors are sort of stifling or oppressing the general population on the island. But anyway, it's a big thing, a big thing I'm not going to really get into here, but the men of the island, they point out that they haven't been able to hold assemblies recently because of the suitors, and so they're pleased that Telemachus has called them to meet in an assembly. So anyway, he recruits some of them, and they agree to go off on a journey with him. Now, the suitors, meanwhile, have their own assembly in which they plot to ambush and kill Telemachus. So, they're not going to let the, they're not going to let this situation get out of hand, because what if he goes and gets help to come back and drive them out, or what if he finds out some news that would be detrimental to the suitors' aspirations, but anyway, 
Telemachus goes first to Pylos, that's P-Y-L-O-S, which is a well-known Mycenaean site where there would have been probably a pretty powerful and significant city-state at the time in which our story is set. Now, by Homer's time, that may no longer, or this site may no longer be such an important place, but there is still some historical memory of its being, having been an important place in the past, in the heroic age. So, there we are. Now, Fagels calls book three, King Nestor Remembers. And Nestor, if you are familiar with the Iliad, you know he's the oldest of the Greek chieftains. So he's the one that they go to for advice, and when he talks, he goes into this long, geriatric-sounding monologue about some adventure he had in the past, and he reflects sadly on the course of time and how he's grown old. But anyway, here's Nestor. And he has sons, too, who are already familiar characters to us, like Antilochus, the fast runner, who brings Achilles the news of the death of his friend Patroclus. So anyway, Telemachus goes to Pulos, and he's hoping that Nestor can tell some, him something about his father, and of course Nestor has complimentary things to say, but he doesn't actually know where Odysseus is. So... That's mainly what happens in Book 3, and I believe... Yes, that's true. Uh, Athena is a companion of Telemachus on this journey, and she is disguised as a man named Mentor. So, the first time she appeared, she was disguised as this guy named Mentes, the lord of the Taphians, but now she's this guy called Mentor. And I'm guessing, although I don't within recent memory, I haven't tried to chase down whether that's where we get the word mentor, but of course I'm guessing it is, because here's mentor, and he's helping this young man go and go out on his journey and find out what he wants to find out, so so Telemachus and Athena, disguised as mentor, they're in Pulos, Nestor doesn't know where Odysseus is, but he has a lot of nice things to say about him. And that is book three. Now, book four is called by Fagels, the king and queen of Sparta. So where is he going now? He's going to Sparta, the famous Greek city-state, which is ruled by Menelaus, the brother of Agamemnon, the husband of Helen, the famous Helen of Troy. And of course, now that the Achaeans, the mainland Greeks, and their allies have won the war with the city of Troy and destroyed it, they, uh, well, Helen and Menelaus are back together, you know, so. So they're the king and queen of Sparta, and they are going to be Telemachus's hosts as he comes to Sparta to seek more, seek news about his father. So, these two also don't know what has become of Odysseus, but like Nestor, they have some nice things to say about him. And, interestingly, Menelaus tells Telemachus about his own adventures, because he is perhaps the Greek chieftain who took the second longest time to get home from Troy. He was blown off course to Egypt and had adventures there with the god Proteus, who changes shapes. That's where we get that word protean from, something that's always changing shape or seems to be different every time you deal with it, you know, so. Anyway, and there's a very rich and, and convoluted tradition in Greek lore that appears in different places in Greek literature, including one of the plays of Euripides, about the adventures of Menelaus and Helen in their travels. And so, in one version, the Helen who's in Troy is actually some kind of doppelganger, and the real Helen is in Egypt, and Menelaus has to go there to find her, but I don't know where that came from, but that's, I could look it up, but I don't know where that came from off the top of my head, but that's not Homer's version. 
in Homer's version, the two of them are together, they're on their way home, etc. But here they are in Egypt, and they have to have an adventure to figure out how they're going to get home. But, of course, at this point in our story, they're home already, and they're relating their adventures to Telemachus. And so that's an interesting little digression in the Odyssey, the adventures of Menelaus in Egypt, etc. Now, they also tell about the story of the Trojan horse. So that never comes up in the Iliad because the Iliad ends before our story has gotten that far. So there's no Trojan horse in the Iliad, but we get a flashback to that, that legendary event in Homer where Menelaus and Helen are telling about their adventures. So, so it's a pretty detailed account, really, but we won't really take time to consider much about it here. But while all this discussion is going on, everyone gets kind of depressed, and Helen puts some kind of drug into their drinks, and then they all feel happy. Now, I mention that because the drug, I believe the word for it that Homer uses is nepenthe, and that sort of become, in the later, in later literature, all the way down to recent times, that's a synonym or that's a, a term for some sort of, some sort of happy pill or something that alleviates your suffering and numbs you and makes you happy, so gives you a sense of well-being or or a happy feeling anyway, but one theory is that it's caffeine, actually, so that's always been interesting to me. So next time you drink some coffee, you can think of that as nepenthe, but although to us, you know, that's we just drink it to wake up or whatever, but, but it also makes you feel good, so there you go. Uh, you, uh, you learn that from Homer now. The King and Queen of Sparta, book four. But it's too bad, they don't know anything about Odysseus, and they have some nice things to say about him, and they're really nice, friendly hosts for young Telemachus, and they want to give him some horses. They want to give him a team of horses. But Sparta, of course, is in some nice open country where you can ride and drive chariots, etc. Ithaca is a rocky place, and so Telemachus doesn't accept the horses. And to his host, that's a sign of what a smart young man he is. But anyway, they get on their way. They stay a little while, and then they get on their way. So book five, we are our scene shifts to what's going on with Odysseus, our main character. So that's something interesting to keep in mind. Everyone thinks of the Odyssey, we always think of it as the story of Odysseus' adventures, and we say the word Odyssey to mean some big adventure, but we've gone through books one through four, and we haven't even met with Odysseus up till now, so obviously there's more to our story, but I won't belabor that point too much, but there you have it. So book five, we finally get to Odysseus, and... Let's see. Zeus is talking to Athena again, then he's talking to Hermes. So he sends Hermes, the messenger of the gods. I don't know if you are familiar too much with Greek mythology, but Hermes is the messenger. So Zeus sends him to the island, which I believe is called Ogugia, uh, Ogija, whatever, where Calypso lives. And apparently she's the only one there, besides Odysseus, who she is keeping with her. And Hermes tells Calypso that she has to allow Odysseus to leave the island. So she's sad, but she, uh, she deals with it. And so Odysseus is happy to find this out, and he spends some time building a raft and or a boat they have some discussion about what kind of boat he's going to build and that she uh she helps him 
to build the right kind of boat. And let's see if there's anything really interesting there. Well, she uh, she sort of importunes him. Calypso sort of importunes Odysseus about why he wants so much to go home when he could stay with her and she can make him immortal so why wouldn't he want to live with this goddess on a beautiful island in the mediterranean etc and just have a nice time on the island and be immortal with his goddess but he says no i want to go home penelope's waiting for me etc so so there's a lot in here about family and about you know what really makes uh makes someone human and so let's let the poet speak instead of me here so he says nevertheless i long i pine all my days although of course penelope is mortal he says i pine all my days to travel home and see the dawn of my return but anyway they they spend a night together, and Odysseus then goes about preparing to leave. And as he sails off on his little boat, the god Poseidon, it says, god of the earthquake, saw him just returning home from his Ethiopian friends. So Poseidon has gotten back from Ethiopia, and he looks out at the sea, and there's Odysseus trying to make a run for it. So... Poseidon is not going to put up with that, so he says, just look at him there, nearing Phaeacia's shores, where he's fated to escape his noose of pain that's held him until now. Still, my hopes ride high. I'll give that man his swamping fill of trouble. So he's going to make it hard for him, even though he knows that eventually Odysseus is fated to get home. So... So Poseidon, the sea god, he wrecks the boat, and Odysseus is shipwrecked again. And we haven't seen him shipwrecked before in our story, but we're going to find out when he tells about his adventures that he has had his share of shipwreck and trouble at sea in the past. But anyway, where does he end up shipwrecked but on an island which Homer calls Phaeacia, and this is usually identified with modern Corfu, which in classical Greek literature is called Corcura. It plays an important role in the, the early parts of Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, but it's a pretty big island off the coast of northwestern Greece. So here he is in Phaeacia. Now, He's shipwrecked, Odysseus is shipwrecked there, and he is totally destitute and all disheveled and shaggy and without any food or water or anything like that, and he's even lost his clothing, so, so he's pretty much just looking like uh, a wild man, you know, so... Here, we meet the royals of the island, and the princess Nausicaa, and later we'll meet her father and mother, the king of the island, Alkinoos, and his wife, Arete, which, of course, is a Greek word that has to do with excellence. So, now, Nausicaa, the princess, she has gone out with her maidservants to the shores, and they're doing wash, they're sort of uh, washing clothes and other textiles or whatever down by the sea, and then they're tossing a ball around, so they're kind of playing volleyball or whatever, you, however you want to think of that, and so they have no idea that Odysseus is there, and then, however, as they're playing ball, the ball goes out into the bush, you know, or out into um, the area where Odysseus is hiding. So the gods, I believe it's Athena, but anyway, Nausicaa, the, the princess, she is 
moved to go after the ball herself. And so Odysseus then steps out and sort of uh, supplicates her. So she sees this wild man come out, and the gods keep her from being afraid of him. And he pleads with her to help him, and uh, flatters her, saying that he thinks she must be a goddess because she's so beautiful, or something like that. And so she takes him back to uh, the uh, back to the town to where her mother and father hold court, and he's introduced to the king and queen of the island. Now let's see how far we actually get. We're in book six now, of course, which Fagels calls the princess and the stranger, and we get to book seven, which he calls Phaeacia's halls and gardens. So Odysseus now is in a town, and he's in or at the compound, or the residence, the headquarters of the king and queen of the island, and they sort of show him around, and they ask him, they ask questions, and they ask him if he's a pirate, actually. They ask him if he was at sea because he was raiding and plundering and making his living that way, or seeking his fortune that way, and they don't ask this in an accusatory way, they just want to know, and often this is cited as an example of how piracy was basically socially acceptable in Homer's time, and how it was even a highly esteemed way of getting ahead in the world, or of making one's fortune, even perhaps more highly esteemed than what we would call honest work. But anyway, having made that note, we'll just go on, uh, go ahead here. So all along this trip into Phaeacian society and court life, Athena has been helping Odysseus by making him appear more handsome or more impressive and less frightening or less bedraggled, and so so that continues, that thread sort of continues throughout this whole episode in Phaeacia. But anyway, they, they're, uh, they're talking and getting to know each other, Odysseus and the king of the island, Alkinoos, and then we get to book eight, which Fagels calls A Day for Songs and Contests. So here in Phaeacia, in book eight, they're having games. They're holding a series of games and contests. And so at one point, at one point either in this book or in the previous one, ah, no, here it is, right here in book eight, there is a bard. There is a singer, a poet, and we'll take a moment to read the actual passage in which he is involved because oftentimes this character, Demodocus the Bard in Phaeacia, is described as being a possible Homer figure or a possible autobiographical depiction of Homer himself or as the probable inspiration for the legendary figure of Homer as being this blind bard. So maybe this is where our poet appears in his own story, or maybe this is just the passage that gave the Greeks the idea that he was blind, but we won't speculate too much about that, but anyway, we've, we've taken a moment to note that. So let's just read the passage now. Quote, in came the herald now, leading along the faithful bard, the muse adored above all others. True, but her gifts were mixed with good and evil both. She stripped him of sight, but gave the man the power of stirring rapturous song. Pontonoos brought the bard a silver-studded chair, right amid the feasters, leaning it up against a central column, hung his high clear lyre on a peg above his head, and showed him how to reach up with his hands and lift it down 
and the herald placed a table by his side with a basket full of bread and cup of wine for him to sip when his spirit craved refreshment. All reached out for the good things that lay at hand, and when they'd put aside desire for food and drink, the muse inspired the bard to sing the famous deeds of fighting heroes, the song whose fame had reached the skies those days, the strife between Odysseus and Achilles, Peleus' son, how once at the gods' lavish feast the captains clashed in a savage war of words, while Agamemnon, lord of armies, rejoiced at heart that Achaia's bravest men were battling so. For this was the victory sign that Apollo prophesied at his shrine in Putho, when Agamemnon strode across the rocky threshold, asking the oracle for advice, the start of the tidal waves of ruin tumbling down on Troy's and Achaia's forces, both at once, thanks to the will of Zeus who rules the world. That was the song the famous harper sang, but Odysseus, clutching his flaring sea-blue cape in both powerful hands, drew it over his head and buried his handsome face, ashamed his hosts might see him shedding tears. So, Odysseus hears the bard singing a heroic song about Odysseus himself getting into an argument with Achilles, and he thinks back to his adventures under the walls of Troy, and he is overcome by emotion and is afraid that he's going to be shedding tears. And of course, the others notice this, and they ask him why why so serious and what is it that's making him sad or it's just a song after all so i guess you're just really into it but but ah no they don't notice him uh they don't notice him being overcome with emotion just yet that comes a little later now they start having these athletic contests, and a character named Laodamas challenges Odysseus, the stranger, who of course hasn't identified himself at this, at this point. He challenges him, I think, to a discus throw, and... Yeah, so Odysseus wins the contest, he throws the discus even farther than his competitor, and finally, uh, here I am stalling for time, well, because he's doing so well in the games, everyone wonders who this stranger might be, and Odysseus finally reveals who he is. So then everyone is taken aback that they have this famous personage with them of whose adventures they just heard in a song, and so they want to know about his previous adventures and how he came to land on their island. And so... Before Odysseus starts telling about his adventures, which is where we leave off at the end of this book, first the bard, Demodocus, possibly Homer in disguise, so to speak, the blind bard picks up his lyre again and he tells a mythological story. So he tells a story now about the gods instead of about heroes. And this story is one of the most famous, uh, one of the f most famous tales included in the Odyssey, other than the frame story itself about Odysseus and his adventures and his return to Ithaca. So what happens in this story is that up on Olympus, the blacksmith god, the god of fire, Hephaestus, or Vulcan in Latin, who is married to Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty, finds out that he's being cuckolded by Ares, the war god, Mars in Latin. So, not that they're exactly the same, but the Romans call him Mars. So, anyway, he finds out that he's being cuckolded, and Hephaestus, being very clever and inventive, is going to find some way of exposing his unfaithful wife and 
her paramour to the opprobrium of the other gods. And he does this by making a kind of magic net. And so he waits for the two of them to be lying together, and he traps them in a magic net. And then all the other go- he brings in all the other gods and, I guess, points and accuses them, saying that, isn't it terrible what they're doing to me here? And now, you know, you can all mock them or uh, revile them, but the gods are just sort of amused by this, and the male gods, they sort of chuckle and laugh among themselves about how they would, how they would like to be in Ares' position right now because he's there with Aphrodite, so that is sort of a, a funny little, um, comic anecdote about the gods behaving in a a comical, undignified, indecent way. And this is one of those stories that later Greek authors, especially the philosophers, all the way down through the centuries, really, from classical times down into Roman times, late antiquity, and even in the Fathers of the Church, etc., They like to go to this story, and others like it, found in Homer, to make a case about how the gods are either... either that the gods are no good, on the one hand, or that the poets are no good because they depict the gods acting this way. So, there is our little story about Hephaestus and Aphrodite and Ares. Now... Back to our original story, or to our frame story here about Odysseus and his adventures, now he's been found out, and he's finally revealed who he really is. And so his hosts, the Phaeacians, they want to know about all the adventures he's had since he left Troy. And so at the end of Book 8, he's about to launch into his story. And so Book 8 ends with the king... Ah, I see. He still hasn't revealed who he is, but they figured out that he is someone more illustrious and someone more significant and interesting, anyway, than they thought he had been up till now. And so they also know that he is somehow involved with all of the great exploits that went on under the walls of Troy, and so they want to know all about it. So the king, I believe it's the king, yeah, okay. So the king Alkinous, the king of the Phaeacians, he asks Odysseus to tell his story, and that's where we'll leave off in this video. So here he says, Did one of your kinsmen die before the walls of Troy? Some brave man, a son by marriage, father by marriage, next to our own blood kin, our nearest, dearest ties, or a friend, perhaps, someone close to your heart, staunch and loyal, no less dear than a brother, the brother in arms who shares our inmost thoughts. And of course, in Book 9, which will where we'll begin in our next video, Odysseus goes ahead and launches into the tale of his adventures. So, there you are. That is Odyssey 1 through 8, and thanks very much for your patience and for staying with us in this presentation, and we will be seeing you soon, so I don't want to take up much more of your time. So anyway, thanks again, and take care. So, yeah, take care.